Hello, everybody. Apparently it's raining uh, in various places around the country, which is ever so good for business. Welcome, if you're planning to be doing something else right now. <laughs> you won't regret it. I'm so excited about today's show. I am, actually. I am. I don't, I don't, I know that if I say this, obviously, everything will go horribly wrong. But I think this is one of my favourite story times, just in terms of just... Anyway, I'm hyping it up and that makes me very uncomfortable. <sighs> uh, I suppose you just, I suppose you get started, really. We want to give people time to gather. You got everything you need? Have I got everything I need? Let's do a little check. We need a piece of paper. Here it is. Um, glue. Yep. Scissors, yes. Still got sort of burned acrylic on them from plastic resin. Oh yeah, and sellotape and two matching things. Yes, I've got the matching ten piece. And the sellotape on oh, and some cardboard. Yeah. <sighs> Just terrifyingly organised. I don't know what to do with myself. Oh well, let's get going, eh? The blinds are shut, more or less. <laughs> okay, I'm flipping it. I'm doing this. Do, 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 do. Oh, more people have arrived. That's nice. That's it. It's always worth a little faff, isn't it? It's always worth a little faff. You ready? You ready? I'm flipping it. I'm flipping you right now. Hello, this is this is ice. Yeah, drip it. You got that. Hello, I am Lara. This is Theo Science. You are the Science Alliance. This is the weekly show where I do you a Lego story time and an activity and tell you everything I've learned about a certain topic. So that topic today is obviously penguins. Um, let's start the activity because some of you might find it really annoying. I'll show you what we're doing. We're going to make, and I'll explain the relevance of it later, we're going to make a balancing bird, like this. Look, this one. So this is a, the sort of fairly famous balancing bird. It doesn't look like it should be able to balance, but you add some weight to its wings, and it can balance just on the tip of its beak. How good is that? Yeah! You could like hang it on the edge of a table, be like a little pet. Um, obviously, that's. we'll talk about why penguins don't look like this. I did try to do a penguin one, where it sort of ha hung like from its bum you can try i just didn't I'm quite sure that that had the same aesthetic appeal but if you want to try that later go for it right <laughs> so that's that's what we're going to make right now so the first annoying thing is i told you to bring an a4 piece of paper we've got an actual we've got to turn that into an a5 piece of paper so fold your a4 piece of paper and then cut it in half and i don't know you can draw a picture on the other half we're not going to use that bit right so <clears throat> The first question we need to answer is why are penguins? They're so weird, aren't they? What is? I mean, they're birds, obviously. Penguins are birds, so therefore they are dinosaurs. We know this, that all birds are dinosaurs, right? Dinosaurs uh, died out what, at the end of the Cretaceous period, about 66 million years ago. But before they died out, some of them had evolved into birds. So you, literally birds are dinosaurs, like scientists call them avian dinosaurs to mean like the difference between the bird dinosaurs and the dinosaurs that lived on land ages ago. Right, when you've got your piece of A5 paper, you need to fold it in half four times. So about 66 million years ago, on the bit of land that is now New Zealand, but at the time it wasn't called New Zealand, it was connected to loads of other bits of land, we found fossils of this bird that looks like a how you'd expect a bird to look, like with the long legs and the sort of fairly big wings, but it can't fly. It has lost the power of flight. And we think that this is sort of the first penguin. So it just kind of started evolving into a penguin. So it, what, it, what was happening really was that it was choosing to swim instead of fly. So um, most birds, one of the reasons they fly is to get away from predators, yeah? Like the reason that chickens can kind of get themselves into trees is because that's all they needed to do to get away from creatures, to be able to nest higher up so that other creatures didn't eat their eggs or anything. But penguins would just happen to be living in a place where there weren't any 
there weren't any predators that were going to attack them if they lived on the ground. So, well, what's the point of flying if you're safe on the ground? So they just stayed on the ground. Right, now fold it out, um, but not completely. Fold it so that you've just got a little kind of book, yeah, like this. See? Fold it like that. That's what you needed to do. So you should have eight squares. And then we'll draw dots on it and it gets intensely annoying. <coughs> So yeah, penguins, they're living somewhere, they're safe on the ground, and yeah, they just kind of choose to get really good at swimming instead of good at flying. So birds, obviously, very long, quite delicate ring wings, they've got muscles that allow them to push down very hard, because a bird flying through the sky, um, it's only the down movement that's useful, right? They're, they push down on the air, and the air kind of pushes back, and that's how they fly through the sky. But for a bird, the upwards movement is totally useless. But for a penguin in the water, going down and up, down and up, they're both useful. They both propel them through the water. So that's why they've got these sort of, they're, they're, that's why they're shaped kind of the way they are. They've got really big chest muscles because they've got incredibly muscly wings so that they can kind of double, I don't know, I suppose sort of double the efficiency. Um, and obviously those delicate wings would be totally useless in the water. Water's a lot denser than there. The wings would get damaged. So they've evolved these very kind of short, streamlined, muscly wings. Uh, are we going to have to... Yeah, we'll do the annoying bit. You're going to have to draw some dots on here, okay? <laughs> and I'm going to try and describe it to you. And I'm going to get in a pickle, but we'll get through it together. It won't take long. Here we are. So, you've got um, a piece of A5 paper folded in half. So, you've got eight little squares. Make it so that it's like a backwards book, okay? Put it on the table so that it opens as if it's a book, but backwards. The first dot you need to draw, wait, I got one, because I knew I'd get it wrong in the show. Uh, the first dot you need to draw is on the top square on the right hand side, do it on the bottom right hand corner. There, okay? So you've got one square on the left, one square on the right on the top, and it's in the bottom right hand corner of the top square. I'm not even very good at lefts and rights, which is gonna make this tricky. Um, and then, oh, draw a dot, in between the two top squares, so like on the first crease, and then draw a dot right in the middle as well, okay? So you've kind of made a triangle. Right in the middle, one above it, and then one crease to the right. You're with me. And then we need to draw, like, in the second square down on the right, in the middle of it, but about a third of the way in, we need to draw another dot and then one in the square below that in the same place. Yeah, you with me? So not quite halfway, like about a third of the way in, yeah? And then finally on the one, two, third crease down on the right, draw another dot in the middle. Whew! I'll just hold that up for you for a bit while I talk more about penguins. So where did we get to? They yeah, so they, they've, they spend 75% of their time in the water. So they've evolved to be incredibly good at swimming, kind of uh, to the detriment of their walking. They're not brilliant at walking. Like, they've got a famous waddle, right? For ages, scientists thought that the reason they had that waddle, uh, that the reason they weren't good at walking is because they sort of chose to waddle. And it was the waddle that made them not very good at walking. Like, if you, for another mammal of the same mass, for a mammal of the same mass, like a creature that weighs about the same as a penguin, penguins walk really inefficiently. They use loads of energy when they walk. Why? Well, it turns out the reason is because they've got really little legs. And the reason they have really little legs is partly so they can tuck them behind them when they're in the water, so they're very streamlined, and partly because you lose a lot of heat through your legs. You've got long legs, you've got blood flowing through your legs, so a lot of heat can escape like from your blood to the air. So if your legs are shorter, you're going to save heat. And penguins generally live in cold places, but not always, as we will see in a sec. Right, have you done that? Now we need to join the dots together, and then that's all the annoying things done. So, here it is. Right, first of all, we need to draw the sort of beak at the top. So join the very top dot to the dot a third way into the second square. And then we'll make the wing by joining that one to the dot sort of in the middle at the top. <laughs> and then we'll join the dots parallel to them as well. So I'm really trying to describe for the people who need that and I'm just doing such a terrible job of it, I'm so sorry. There you go, that's starting to look like a bed. And then join those two dots at the bottom and that's the tail, okay? And now we're gonna cut that out. I'll show you that for a bit as well. 
Uh, yeah, so they just chose to be good at swimming instead of good at walking. Right. Um, so, yeah, okay. I'm going to show you my little slideshow in a minute when I know that you've done this, and then you can be cutting it out while you're watching my little slideshow. Because there's, there's, a, there's about, I think, 18 different species of penguin. They Penguins don't live at the South Pole. This was the big bombshell to me. They don't live at the South Pole, right? We looked at, in the Antarctic show, how the South Pole is kind of in the middle of the Antarctic. Antarctica is land, and the South Pole's in the middle. Penguins don't live there because they need to eat fish and little shrimpy things like krill and stuff that is in the water. So they generally live on the coast. So number one, penguins don't live at the South Pole. It's too far inland. Number two, um, only five penguins live in Antarctica, and only two penguins only live in Antarctica. Other well, penguins live all kinds of places. So now hopefully you've done this. Can you please be cutting that out while I show you my little slideshow of some of my favourite penguins? <laughs> now, we're going to look at the penguin family tree, because I always like to go back to the beginning. I, I'm not a biologist, and I can't get my head around like families and genus and species unless I start with the cat family. Just, I don't know why, I have to start with cats every time because they're familiar. So I'm going to show you like the cat family tree and then we'll do the same for penguins and hopefully it'll make sense. Okay, here we go. Come down here with me. So this is the cat family, right? So all the cats that you can think of are in what's called the, the cat family or the Felidae family if you want to be all... Latin about it. So the cat family is split into different genus, genus I, genuses. So here's a selection of four of them. And the genuses are split into species. So for example, in the cat family, you've got the lynx genus, and some species in that lynx genus are the lynx and the bobcat. All right. And you've also got the asinonyx genus, which has the cheetah in it. Okay. So you, you know, that cheetahs sort of, they're a bit off on their own. They're like a weird kind of cat and this is why because they evolved slightly differently so they're in the same family as the lynx and the bobcat but they're in a different genus like the sort of category in the middle yeah and then you've got the felis genus which is your bog you know, your pet cats that you guys really like and the panthera genus which is the cool ones like the lions and the tigers so these ones can roar and these ones can't so they're all slightly different yeah but they're all in the cat family okay right let's do that for penguins now so the penguin family is called the Svenicidae. Svenicidae. It's quite good. Uh, I don't know what relation it has to penguins. And there's only six genus in that family, so we can learn about them all. They are the crested, the banded, the brush-tailed, the large, the small, and the yellow-eyed. So all, I think, 18 species of penguins that I mentioned, they all fall into these categories, okay? These genus. All right, so just a few of the ones that I found that I really liked. The crested ones, yeah, you know the ones, they've got those little yellow crests on the side of them. Um, oops, here we go. <clears throat> the most common penguin in the world is the macaroni, which is this one, the crested penguin. Uh, and the crest is so they recognize each other. Like, I'll just, yeah, because this is cool, I didn't know this. Um, it's so, specifically, when they're diving down in like gloomy dark water and they can't see each other very well, uh, the crest is so they can recognise their own species, partly for breeding, because, you know, they lay eggs, make babies with penguins of the same species, but also because they hunt together. And you don't want to help another penguin catch a fish if it turns out it's not in your gang and it's not going to share that fish with you. That's one of the reasons why these guys have crests. Okay, second crested penguin. I don't even have much to say about it. I just like the look of it. Look at this. This is the rock hopper. And my favourite fact about the rock hopper is that they're the only penguins that jump into the water feet first. How's that for a very good niche pub quiz question? Um, yeah, and they hop on rocks. That's how they get their name. All right. Next kind is the banded. Uh, the Humboldt penguin is the one that you might have seen. They're very popular in zoos because they're used to warm temperatures. They live in the deserts of South America. The penguins in temperatures of around 21 degrees. So note the skin around their eyes. This is so, it keeps them cool. So if they're too hot, they send blood to these patches around their eyes and it's very easy for heat to escape from there, yeah? So it cools them down. Um, <clears throat> they dig nests in sand or penguin poo, like you would, you know? And like I say, very popular with zoos because they're acclimatised to warm weather. Oh, look at these guys. This is a, the brush-tailed one, the most famous kind, I think. It's probably the chin strap. Uh, it lays two eggs instead of one. 
and it raises its chicks to adults, which is quite unusual. But mainly, look at it, it's wearing a little helmet. It's so funny. <coughs> Chin strap, brushed out penguin there. And they live in or near Antarctica, but not only there. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, the large is the emperor and the king. I'm not going to say too much about these guys because the rest of the show is going to be about emperor penguins. Um, this is an Adeli penguin, which I haven't mentioned, but that's the, the emperor penguin and the Adeli penguin are the only ones that only live in Antarctica and nowhere else. But the whole of story time is about emperor penguins, so I won't say too much about them. And the small. It's the smallest. It only lives for six and a half. You look at it. It's so small. It's like 24 centimetres tall. And it lives at the bases of cliffs in New Zealand and Australia. Australia, I didn't know you guys had penguins. And look how cute it is. Oh, you win, Australia. You win this one. And um, yeah, sort of slightly dark ending. Uh, this is the yellow-eyed penguin, which is really shy and private. It lives in islands around New Zealand. It nests among tree trunks in forests. And it's so shy, I shouldn't laugh. So much does it want to be out of sight of other penguins that if it sees them... Uh, it might stop parenting. Like, it might just freak out. Be like, nope, no, I can't, can't do this anymore. You've, you've interrupted me with your eye contact. I don't know. So there you go. That's a yellow penguin, yellow-eyed penguin. Right, come back here. Have you cut out your little thing? When you've cut out your thing, you need to stick it to some cardboard. But I'll do my cutting now. I think maybe before you stick it to cardboard, um, make some improvements, all right? Because I think the beak needs to be a little bit beakier. Let's make the beak a little bit pointier and let's make the wings a little bit less boxy. So um, how do we make, like just go in a little bit more with the wing and make the beak a bit pointier, not too much more, but there. And then instead of this weird square wing, I'm going to make the wing a bit more curvy. There we go. Yeah. And then open it out. So you should have something like this. I just tore the wing, but it doesn't matter because we're sticking it to cardboard. Yeah, something like that. Right, so I said we'd talk about emperor penguins. Emperor penguins are the only, well, yeah, they're one of only two penguins that live only in Antarctica. And they're the only animal that lays its eggs, breeds in the absolute depths of winter in Antarctica. So where they eat and hunt is quite far away from where they breed. So like in, in wintertime, the krill, which they mainly live on, it dives down quite low into the ocean. So they've got to go out into the ocean, really fatten themselves up, put on loads of weight by eating loads of krill. And then they make this journey to the breeding ground, which is on the ice of Antarctica. Um, and the female lays an egg, which takes an awful lot of energy, and then gives it to the male. And the male, it's very famous, you might have seen like documentaries, there's a March of the Penguins, I think 2011 documentary. Uh, Frozen Planet have done this stuff. The male puts the one egg that the female lays onto its feet. It's got special oil in its feet so that its feet don't freeze. It's got a little flap that it kind of covers the egg with. Uh, and it just stays in the depths of Antarctica at temperatures between like minus 40 and minus 70 for three months, all the way through the winter, while the female quickly goes back to where the food is and fattens up again because she's used a lot of energy um, having the egg and she needs to sort of tag team when the chick hatches so that the dad can go and do the same thing. So my question first is why, why do emperor penguins lay their eggs in the depths of winter? Why don't they just wait until it's spring? Why right now? Because the, the winter in Antarctica starts in about April. Right now Hundreds and hundreds, thousands of emperor penguins in Antarctica are huddled, suffering these terrible temperatures. Why? Why? It's a brilliant answer. It's an adorable little answer. Think about it. Why do they lay the eggs in winter and not in spring or summer when it would be more comfortable for them to look after the eggs? It's because... It gives the chick more chance of survival. It's because when the chick hatches out, it's getting to Antarctic spring. So the chick's got as long as possible to eat, fatten up, lose its feathers, grow more feathers and be healthy. Isn't that cute? So the, the mum and dad go through all these terrible conditions so that the, the chick has the best chance of life. Love it. Right, let's get this piece of paper glued to the cardboard. So just, I don't know, slather some cardboard in glue if you like and then stick the piece of paper to it and then cut it out, and then we're nearly there. Um, so yes, 
some, someone was saying in the comment section the other day, that is terrible mothering. How does the female lay an egg and then just go off and eat food? It's like, no, but it's all very carefully coordinated. It's just amazing teamwork. So the male is the one <clears throat> that sort of famously stands in the cold for three months and they all huddle together. So the temperature actually inside a penguin huddle can get up to 24 degrees. It's pretty much room temperature. And what they do is if there's a blizzard and a really icy wind starts to blow um, against like the ones on one side of the huddle, then those ones have got the icy wind blasting against them. They move really throw slowly through the centre of the huddle to the other side. And then the penguins that are sort of revealed and exposed and they have the icy wind blasting against them, they do the same thing, like move through the middle and get to the other side. And so it just keeps going. During a blizzard, a penguin horde, I don't know, group of penguins can move up to 200 metres in this way. And I was just thinking, imagine humans trying to do that. Imagine you were huddled together with loads of humans for warmth and then some of them came past you like, no, it's too cold for me, no, I'm going to the warm side and you're just left in the cold. Like, how would you feel? I think we quite quickly start sort of panicking and shouting at each other. And then I thought, well, I guess if emperor penguins did that, they wouldn't survive. Like if the group split up, they would all freeze to death. So I suppose they've just evolved to just work incredibly cooperatively with each other. Right, I'm going to cut this out now. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I'm full of cold, aren't I? Um, yes, so then the female comes back. Like, pretty much when the, when the um, egg's about to hatch, or maybe just after it's hatched, the female comes back. She's been eating again, so she's got fat reserves. She's good to go. And the male has lost about half his body weight. He then goes off uh, to get fattened up again and get healthy as well. It's very sweet that apparently often the female really has to persuade the male to give up the egg or give up the chick. Like the male's just been kind of hunkered down for three months and is in the zone of looking after the egg. And the female's like, it's okay, I'm here. I can do this too. Very sweet. Apparently penguin groups of male penguins, they kind of lose their identity and, and just start acting like as one for three months. I don't know be amazing i'd love to be in the head of a penguin right now um so yeah female comes back male goes off and gets fattened up female looks after the egg and then um once the penguin little tiny baby penguin is born and looked after the female then has to go and put on more weight again because i didn't know this um penguins molt they just lose their feathers and have to get more feathers. I mean, obviously their feathers have been through a lot, what with all the blizzards and stuff. But while penguins are molting, which takes about a month, they uh, they can't swim because they're not waterproof. So they've just got to kind of, they can stay in the breeding ground or they can go somewhere else, but they've just got to sort of stay safe. And again, make sure they've put on enough weight that they don't end up starving because they can't go into the water and catch krill because feathers, yeah. Uh, right. I think that is, that's like the tale of the penguin, penguin breeding that I wanted to tell you. There are other awesome facts about emperor penguins in particular, which are the biggest penguins. They're about the height of a sort of average human female. Um, emperor penguins are the ones, again, another tricksy question for you. So I've cut that out now. Emperor penguins are the ones that their pupils, like the black dot in the middle of your eye where the light goes in, the pupils of emperor penguins are like a pinprick but they can, and they're the only penguins that can do this, they can make their pupil 300 times bigger. Why? <coughs> I don't want to blow my nose because I'll take my beak off. Why are emperor penguins the ones that their eyes can go from a pinprick to 300 times bigger? I've got other good questions today, eh? Come on, think of the answer. I'll give you five seconds. Sort of give you a clue when I said about the krill diving down. It's because they dive, they're the deepest divers. Emperor penguins, they're the biggest ones and they can dive for up to 500 meters and there's very little light down there. So their eyes are very, their pupils are very small in daylight on land, but when they get 500 meters down, <laughs> suddenly their pupils are really big. Let as much light in as possible, help them to see. Okay, now you need to just do a little bit of bending, right? You need to bend the beak to make it a bit more 3D. I'm so gross, I'm so sorry. <coughs> and then bend the wings down a bit. And then put your weights, maybe you've got matching pasta shapes or matching Lego bricks, I'm gonna use 10 peas. And attach the 10 peas 
to the front of the wings and hopefully it'll balance. You'll see it doesn't balance now. Let's talk a bit about balancing. Why doesn't it balance now? Uh, it's because look, the back is too heavy. So instead of talking about weight, I'm gonna talk about mass, which sort of means like the stuff that you're made of, kind of, not really, but it'll do for now. So most of the like particles of this bird are at the back here. So that side is heavier. So it's getting pulled down. So what we need to do is add some mass to the front so that it balances out. So that's what we'll do. Get my sound tape. Um, do you remember if you saw the duck show that I told you that ducks have like, you know, those uh, water bottles that guinea pigs and rabbits have where they, they touch them and the water comes out so they can drink it. I told you that ducks have basically a tiny one of those near their bums and it's called the uropagal gland and it releases oil for them that they rub all over their bodies to keep them waterproof but also uh, to kill microbes so that their wings don't get like rotted or anything. Penguins have the same thing! Yay! Penguins have one of those little guinea pig water bottles attached to their bumps so they also do the kind of nuzzling with their beak thing to get the oil. It's like an oil dispenser, adorable. And then put it all over their bodies. Um, <coughs> They don't have teeth. Penguins do not have teeth. So I'm sellotaping my tempies to my wings now, yeah? You can do the same thing. They don't have teeth, but... Um, and they don't have taste buds either. Well, that's not true. We can't find any taste buds. Science cannot find taste buds on penguins. It doesn't mean they're not there. But we do know that the, the signal that sort of sends the taste from your taste buds to your brain doesn't work very well in cold temperatures. So it might be that peng you know, most penguins just live in such cold places that that, that wasn't working anyway. I don't know. This, the theory is that's maybe why they eat fish like just <coughs> because why not? No point in tasting it, they haven't got taste buds, but we don't know. But the little bumps on your tongue, which you maybe feel now, we think of those as being taste buds, but they're not actually. Those bumps on your tongue are, I think pap papier, papier, papier. Um, they're, they're bumps that have the taste buds in them. Penguins don't have the taste buds, but they do have the bumps. And their bumps are ludicrously pronounced. So they, people think they have teeth because there's a picture of a penguin, sort of looks like it's attacking a camera. And it's got these terrifying, like really sharp pointy things in its mouth, but they're not teeth. They're basically like the little bumps on your tongue, but much bigger. Okay, I've stuck my 10 peas on. Oh yeah, that's pretty good. I'm gonna bend my wings down a little bit more. And now you can do some decorating, yeah? And I'll tell you why we made a balancing bird when we're talking about penguins that don't even have wings like this. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Let's see if it balances on the side of my sophisticated uh, camera phone holder. Oh yeah, look at that. Come on, pretty good. I think that could be a nice little pet if you color it in and add some eyes and stuff. So the centre of mass of this bird now, we've got some mass at the back and we've got just enough mass at the front that the very centre of this bird's mass is, is over that beak there, right? So let's talk a little bit about centre of mass. Yeah, let's do some physics. I worked some physics in. I'm a physics teacher. Your centre of mass is kind of the, sort of the point in your body where you can imagine that all your mass is concentrated. It's really hard to explain and it's like really actually sort of quite easy to understand I think. So your base is, <coughs> your base is like how much area your, your feet take up. So this is like your base and your center of mass is in the middle of your body, right? So as long as your center of mass is over your base, you do not fall over. If, come on, if, uh, well, it doesn't work with humans actually. I was gonna say, if a human bends over like this, and puts their centre of mass beyond their base. Like now, look, here, the centre of mass acts downwards. So here, the centre of mass is above the base, so you don't fall over. Here, the centre of mass is not over the base, so you would fall over. Actually, human bodies are clever, and that's not how people bend over. When humans bend over, their back sort of bum sticks out a bit more as well to kind of balance it out. So the centre of mass moves over to here. Probably getting a bit complicated now. Um, but anyway. What I'm telling you all this for is that scientists did an experiment where they, it's not the scientific word for it, but they basically kidnapped some penguins. They basically kidnapped about, I think, 10 emperor penguins, just as they were all like big and healthy and full of food and ready to breed. And they 
kept them in a pen and they put them on a treadmill to see how they would walk. And then they kept them in the pen for two weeks, so they lost some of their body weight, and then they put them on the treadmill again to see how they walked again. Science. And it turns out that the penguins didn't walk as well um, the first time, when they were bigger. They didn't walk when they were all full of food, ready to do their breeding, as well as when they were less full. So from this, the scientists concluded that, like, nature is a balance. So, penguins, I've been trying not to say, they just put on as much weight as they can so that they're healthy, so that they can survive the winter, because that's not quite true. If they just put on as much weight as they possibly could, then they probably wouldn't make it to the breeding ground, because they wouldn't be very stable, they wouldn't walk as well, they might fall over, and they'd be more likely to be attacked by predators. So, they have to put on enough weight that they, the males do, that they have, that they can survive the winter um, without starving to death, but not so much weight that makes them vulnerable. Trixie, eh? So yeah, when they, then when they pile on weight, apparently they do it, it goes, it all goes to the front of their body, so that makes their centre of mass move a little bit forward, so they're like, not as stable, yeah? Right, oh, it's nearly time for story time. Very quickly, penguins used to be giant. <laughs> Who knew? Estella did, she alerted me to this. Penguins used to be massively giants. Oh, giving that shout out has reminded me. Hello, Grace and Rose, maybe, if you're watching this. If you're not watching this, then <laughs> that was embarrassing. Um, yeah, between about 20 million years ago and uh, 40 or 60 million years ago, penguins are just really big. So the tallest emperor penguin I've said now is about the size of a human female. I'll show you. Okay, a deli, pretty standard penguin. Emperor penguin, very big. Here's a diagram of an emperor penguin next to an adult female. It's from like beak to tip, so imagine it's got its beak in the air. They found fossils of penguins that were this big, like two metres tall. Very, very big. We don't know why they were so big. They've got really long beaks, like herons. We, we don't know why they were that big. But, uh, maybe because they ate a lot of food, help them with diving. We don't know. Scientists are just guessing. But anyway, yes, they used to be giant penguins. They couldn't fly. They didn't have teeth. Uh, we haven't found that many fossils, but yeah, cool. Hey, right, time for story time. True story, as always, follows very nicely on from last week when we learned about Scott's, um, Shackleton's adventure in the Antarctic. Anyway, I won't say any more. I'll just show you it. Let's do this. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> me, 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 me. The worst journey in the world. A true story by Apsley Cherry Gerard. So last week we heard how in 1940 Shackleton explorer tried to be the first person to cross Antarctica because it had never been done before. The reason that he made that journey, tried to make that journey, is because being the first person to get to the South Pole had already been done. So let's go back a little bit on that story. In 1911, the South Pole hadn't been reached by humans. No human had ever been to the South Pole. So an explorer, very famous explorer, called Captain Robert Scott, he tries, he tries to be the first person to get to the South Pole. And we, we found uh, last week that he built a beautiful hut um, that other explorers in the future found. It was very helpful to them. Robert Scott does not succeed at being the first person to get to the South Pole. But... This story isn't about him. It's about some other people on his team. So here they are. Uh, Edward Wilson is Scott's chief scientist. Henry Bowers is there as well. And Apsley Cherry Gerard. They are all on Scott's team. Six months after these three men arrive in Antarctica, they're sent on a separate mission. This is the actual map that they have. Uh, this dotted line is where they went. This mission was going to take them five weeks. It was going to be undertaken very much mainly in complete darkness. Why? Why were just three men from the many people on Scott's team sent on this completely separate journey? Well, the clue is in the pink circle here. Yes, the emperor penguin lives only in Antarctica and at the time it's thought to be the most primitive bird on Earth. Okay, remember it evolved, it separated out from birds like 66 million years ago, really just at the end of the dinosaurs. Some scientists believe that how a chick develops in a shell is also how it evolved. So if you could watch a chick developing in a shell, you'd understand everything about how birds evolved. 
So an emperor penguin chick would show how reptiles and birds are related. Wilson, remember, chief scientist on Scott's team, he is one of the scientists that believes this theory. So he does a, a lecture on penguins where he says the earliest bird had teeth, right? So one hopes to find real teeth in the embryo of the emperor penguin, even though none are present in the adult bird. Isn't that an amazing idea? So that you would see the evolution, that the chick in the egg would get teeth and then lose its teeth again before it came out. So, in daylight, in summer, it would be a very, very, very difficult journey getting to the only emperor penguin colony they know of at the time and collecting an egg. But obviously we know that emperor penguins lay their eggs in the depths of winter, don't they? Um, the horror of the 19-day journey to the nesting site, Cherry tells us later, cannot be described, but he gives it a go, and his true story becomes a book. Oh, no, don't do that. Come on, stay. Thank you. Being in 70, minus 70 degrees, Cherry says, wouldn't be too bad if you could see where you were going, but for most of the time, the team walk in complete darkness. They can't see their sled straps, they can't see their footsteps, so they don't know where they're going. They can't find their way around. Uh, they can't even see their oven to cook with. And all they know about the ground underneath their feet is from the sound that their shoes make. So they fall into crevices again and again and again. They have to light a match to see their compass. But... It's so wet and cold that it can take four or five boxes of matches before one of them finally lights, just so they have any clue where they're going. They were supposed to pull the sledges for eight hours and then sleep for about seven hours, and that would leave them nine hours for camp work. That was the plan. But actually, in reality, conditions are so difficult that it, it takes them a lot longer. Even basic jobs take ages. So Cherry tells us that in the morning they get up and their clothes are frozen. And sometimes it takes two men to just pull the clothes into shape so that they can put them on. Lead, Cherry says, uh, he's sure would have been a lot easier to wear. The problem, Cherry tells us, is sweat and breath. And here's a, a lovely quote from him. He says, um, I never knew before how much of the body's waste comes out through the pores of the skin. All this sweat, instead of passing away through the porous wool of our clothing and gradually drying off us, froze and accumulated. Um, at one point, oops, Cherry actually <laughs> he gets up and just comes out of his tent and looks at something for about 15 seconds and then realises that all his clothes are frozen around his head and he can't move his head and he has to walk for four hours pulling a sledge with his head in exactly the same position. Um, he gets blisters on his hands and the liquid in the blisters freezes. He says it's absolute agony. Eventually, the liquid in the blisters thaws out and he manages to uh, pop them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and that does relieve the pressure, and eventually the blisters disappear. Whew. They stop paying attention to night and day because they can't tell the difference anyway. Uh, it's Antarctica and it's winter, so there's about four hours of daylight between about 11 a.m. and about 3 p.m. There you go, chaps. I hope you enjoyed it. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not all awful. At one point, the team lies down, Cherry says, and looks at the sky, and apparently there's an incredible display of southern lights. <coughs> me. <clears throat> Cherry says, Most of the sky was covered with a swinging, swaying curtain, which met in a great whirl overhead, lemon yellow, green and orange. He also says, I couldn't see any of it because I'm very nearsighted and it's too cold to wear glasses in Antarctica because they would freeze to your face, but you know, Nice for the other guys. <laughs> but finally, having nearly died multiple times, they come to an enormous hill which leads to the cliffs of Cape Grozier. Um, Cherry tells us that this, this hill is 
so the snow is so hard and shiny that it's like trying to walk up a huge china teacup but they use these tools called crampons and eventually they reach the top of the mountain he says they're shaking so hard from cold he thought their bones would break he actually says that at this point he didn't care whether he lived or died he was in so much pain but they found the only known emperor penguin colony on earth here incredibly uh, is a painting that wilson chief scientist painted presumably in antarctica uh, from memory i guess after we got back from base but look yeah this is an actual watercolor of wilson's that memory of seeing these emperor penguins in antarctica 1911 absolutely gorgeous so they do make it back they take five eggs two of them break on the way cherries ones actually get cracked they put them in their mittens to keep them warm um, and here's wilson and bowers and cherry gerard back at the camp again a little reminder of what cherry gerard looked like before that journey and what he looks like afterwards now Wilson and Bowers are later chosen by Scott to join him on his final push to the South Pole. So only the fittest people are chosen to actually make the journey to the South Pole. So they do get there. There's Wilson. There's Bowers sitting down. And uh, there's the famous Scott. <clears throat> they make it to the South Pole. But they, when they get there, they find out that they haven't got the record. They're not the first people to get there. Some people did get there before them. And sadly, um, they do not make it back. So Bowers and Wilson never leave Antarctica. Cherry, however, he hasn't gone on that last journey. He's determined to finish the job. So when he gets back to England, he takes the eggs to the Natural History Museum, where he doesn't get heroes welcome. The, uh, one person says to him, what do you want? This ain't an egg shop. They, they've got no idea what he's been through. Remember that Wilson had believed that how a chick develops in a shell is also how it evolved. Well, by the time the eggs are studied, that theory is disproved. Not true. The eggs are useless to science. But, as the Natural History Museum says, um, they are a fragile symbol of the quest for knowledge. So they're not on show all the time, but if you go to the Natural History Museum at the right time, you still can see the emperor penguin egg that was collected on Robert Scott's journey. Here we go. This is the little hole that when they got the eggs back to camp, Wilson cut a hole and took, took the little chick out to study it. And that's a close-up for you. The end. Images by Vic Dizzy. Not, not going on in that story. Very sad, but I don't know. There's something about that I find incredibly powerful. <coughs> <sighs> right, you lot. That is the end of The Penguin Show. Thank you so much for joining me. Shall I do my little ad? And then I've got to rush off because on uh, Facebook we're doing a lesson today. If you're on Facebook and you want to come to a lesson at 11 o'clock about uh, reducing and reusing and recycling and what those words mean and do a little activity where we make some paper, then you are so welcome. I'm just going to Facebook now to see if anyone's left me any comments. Because if you are on Facebook, you can uh, go to Facebook and comment on this show and I will read your comments. Thank you very much, by the way, because I never say this. Thank you very much to the people who come every week and watch and just don't comment. The people who've never been in touch with me, but who are always here watching. I really appreciate you. It would not work if everyone commented. It just wouldn't work. Uh, right, so yeah, if you would like to support me, if you're enjoying these shows or the home ed lessons and you want to pay me five pounds a month, that is literally all I need to be able to do this job. It's so cool. Enough people are doing it because I can reach an infinite audience. But if everyone who watches pays me five a month, uh, then yeah, I'm golden. I'll even send you a thank you. So the thank you you will get at the moment is uh, this latest issue of Theatre of Science magazine. It comes out every two months. I write it. Graphic designer, illustrator, husband does that to it. And I'm so proud of it. This one's got, a, it's on mould, so I send you a free biodegradable plastic bag so that you can build a little box, put some food in it and watch the mould grow. So lucky. Um, there's a choose your own adventure. Will you get fired from your job in a museum that you've inexplicably got? Uh, and there's a beautiful comic that my husband had illustrated about the only female British person to have a Nobel Prize in science. Hmm, who knew? If you sign up now, then oh, I'll send you the Rainforest magazine because I keep saying it that I will. Um, yeah, you've got about another week where if you sign up, you get both of these straight away and some rainbow glasses. It's amazing. Incredible value. <laughs> Thank you, everyone who has signed up to that. Right. 
that's um that is the end of the photo end of the photo end of the show unless you've commented on facebook oh <gasps> wow loads of comments brilliant let's have a look oh hello george hello i hope you're still here sorry it always takes me ages to get to the facebook comments wow george facebook is showing me the most relevant comments and yours was at the top so well done for being relevant today <laughs> have we started Oh, sorry, Kimberly. I hope you found it. It's really confusing on YouTube, eh? Whoa, Kira's just sent me a massive gif of a skipping penguin. This is why I need my comments. Right. Um... Oh, Kimberly wasn't getting it. Refresh. She's live now. Oh, thanks, Sarah. Oh, Sarah's been really trying to help you. I hope you found it. Um, oh! Who's this? Rebecca, hello. Ah, oh, Rebecca found me. Yay, thank you. You typed Theatre of Science Penguins, wow. Oh, hello, Suki and Arts of Eunice. Hello, hello. Hello, Samuel. You forgot to watch Monday, so it's good you're repeating it today. It is good. It's always smoother the last time round. Uh, the, I think the problem is that it takes me a little bit of time to put up a thing on Facebook saying, I'm live on YouTube now, and then go live on YouTube. I think, uh, oh, you found it, good. Oh, hello, Olivia. How did the watercolour not freeze? Oh yeah, how did watercolour paints not freeze? Well, they had their, um, they had their hut. This is a very good point. In fact, it's in the mould magazine. <clears throat> in the mould magazine, I couldn't put a picture of it in because it's copyrighted, but I do mention that they found mould in Scott's hut. So you should um, have a look at it. I, I tell you, I think if you, if you Google Scott's hut, you'll find some beautiful pictures, but on Google Maps, you can go into it and see the pictures. So it's quite, it is quite amazing how permanent the buildings were that they made. Like they had sort of proper beds and sleeping bags and you know, a roof and it, I think it was probably fairly warm in the hut. It's just obviously the hut was kind of on the edge of where they needed to be and they used that as a base to do other things. But when they got back from that horrendous journey to the Emperor Penguin Colony, it, they, they probably would have had, you know, you could just sit and chill in the hut. I don't know, yeah, look it up, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's still got like food on the shelves. They've done a really good job of pre preserving it. Hello, Alice. Oh, it's Alice. And there's George. Oh, lovely. Oh, Alice, were you the person who was trying to find it? Did you find me? Oh, no, it was somebody else. Oh, I hope Kimberly found it. Anyway. Right, I think I've said hello to everyone. Good. And I'm glad everyone found me, and thank you very much for the penguin gift. Okay, I'm going to go and get set up for reduce, reuse, recycle. Come with me if you would like to make some... <laughs> some really slick recycled paper. There's no show next week. There's no show for two weeks because um, it's half term and bank holidays and all my children's birthdays. But the show will be back in two weeks and Home Ed is taking a one week break for half term. So there's no Home Ed next week, but there is Home Ed the week after that. All right, you lovely lot. Thank you so much for coming. Bye.